Thank you. Ethel May, that was such a nice introduction. There is no upside in my saying anything because it will just diminish uh, the flavor it was just said. Uh, she said some very nice things about me, and some of them were even true. Um, and I, I asked her, I said, you tell me something about uh, the people of Joplin. She said, well, you know, every one of them needs a new roof. <laughs> Milton Friedman says there's no such thing as a free lunch, but for all of you, that's not true today. Uh, and thank you all for coming, and especially thank uh, you, Ethel May, uh, for hosting this and to all of your associates at uh, uh, TAMCO. Uh, the Show Me Institute uh, is a public policy research think tank. Uh, my youngest son the other day said, do you guys just sit around and think all day? Um, and someone else said, how big is that tank? Um, so, you know, we're scoring a lot of points right off the bat. Uh, but our job is to foster research into what are the best public policies for the state of Missouri and the cities therein. And generally what we are doing and will do is to find the best economist and public policy analyst to do the research uh, that we need. Then we have to take that research, translate it, make it user-friendly, and get it out to the public, the cognoscenti, and most of all, we have to lean on our dearly beloved public policy makers. You notice how I said that because there are some of them in the room. Um, and uh, our goals are to have a, a major impact, to get a much better tax structure in the state of Missouri. Uh, my own goal, I think it is shared, but I, I can't say for sure yet, my own goal is to see that the personal income tax in Missouri is eliminated. Um, uh, economists uh, of almost all persuasions uh, will agree that income taxes and taxes on capital or profits are the most distortionary of taxes. They do the greatest harm, and by taxing people's income, you are taxing the most mobile resource, and people will move to avoid income taxes. We only have to look at places like Nevada, who every day, every Nevadian should get up and thank California, uh, because California is loaded with idiotic policies, uh, and they are going to get a lot worse. Uh, their top income tax bracket right now is 10 and a half, and it's going to go to 12.2 uh, with the new initiative that's being started by, you all remember the meathead, Rob Reiner? Well, that's what's going on there. So it's things like that that we want to avoid. Uh, other really bad taxes in this state are the earnings taxes of St. Louis and Kansas City. Uh, they have done tremendous damage uh, to not just those cities, but to the state. Uh, Metro East, the part of St. Louis on the other side of the river, owes its existence and its growth to the bad tax policies of St. Louis uh, and the state of Missouri. And the other big area, of course, is education. We want to see that there is some real form of school choice and competition especially in the inner cities of St. Louis and Kansas City. And uh, finally, I must say it is really a delight uh, to be back in Missouri, and it's a delight not to be out on the left coast. Um, you know, that place is, I hope I don't offend anybody here. I've never done that before in my life. Um, there's, you know, there, you're just surrounded by, by liberals out there, and of course, you, you can always tell a liberal. You just can't tell them very much. <laughs> Ethel May, thank you very much. I really am thrilled to be here, in part because I've long referred to Ethel May as my Missouri mom, and it's always great to get back and, and see her, and also because uh, I'm going to be able, I hope, in this hour and maybe in some of the other presentations I've made, uh, to be of help to uh, one of the newest and most dynamic and promising free market think tanks in the country, the Show Me Institute. I have visited uh, think tanks by the dozens around the country and around the world, and many of them have sent uh, delegations to our headquarters to learn how we do what we do. And I can say from what I understand of uh, the early days here of the Show Me Institute that you folks are poised to make history. And if I can be of any way, in any way helpful in, in that regard, I'll uh, wear it as a, as a great badge of honor. So I'm delighted to be here. If you're already supporters of the Show Me Institute, I thank you. And if you're considering becoming a supporter, let me say thank you for that as well. You'll not be disappointed. I have a story I'd like to uh, open with, and it happens to be a true story. It comes from a testimony before a congressional committee some years ago from a developer in Louisiana. And uh, as this story goes, the developer 
was planning a new construction project. At one point, he learned that he had to secure the approval first of no fewer than 23 local, parish, and state agencies before he could begin. And just when he thought everything was done and ready to go, he learned that he had to apply for approval from the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Washington. So he and his attorney filled out all the required forms, sent them off to HUD, whereupon the agency sent back the following reply. We received today your letter enclosing application for your client in support of abstract of title. We have observed, however, that you have not traced the title to the property previous to 1803. Before final approval can be granted, you must trace the title previous to that year. And you can imagine uh, the developer and his attorney were outraged as, at this example of bureaucratic foot dragging, and they fired off to HUD the following reply, which has in the years since become somewhat of a classic. Dear gentlemen, your letter regarding title has been received. I noted that you wished title to be traced further back than I have done. Well, I was unaware that any educated man failed to know that Louisiana was purchased from France in 1803. <laughs> but he doesn't end there. He goes on to say, the title to that land was acquired by France by right of conquest from Spain. The land came into the possession of Spain by right of discovery in 1492 <laughs> by an Italian sailor named Christopher Columbus. <laughs> The good Queen Isabella had taken the precaution of securing the blessing of the Pope of Rome upon Columbus's voyage before she sold her jewels to help him. The Pope, in turn, is the emissary of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. <laughs> God made the world. I think it's safe to assume that God created that part of the world known as the U.S. and that part of the U.S. known as Louisiana, and I hope the hell you're satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the spirit there summarizes uh, maybe much of my message today. I want to talk to you about seven principles of sound public policy. And I always like to begin this by telling people that none of these seven principles are original with me. They will sound very familiar to you. Uh, you may have heard uh, far more notable people than me uh, put, them, put them to use in speeches like uh, Ronald Reagan or Milton Friedman. I've simply collected seven of them, put them in this one talk, and added some of my own examples, and I like to present them as simple but enormously profound. These principles are so important, I think, that uh, if every state legislature and at the federal capitol in Washington, if every capitol building in every state and in Washington had them emblazoned in, in the cornerstones of their buildings, and more importantly, if legislators every day passed them, read them, understood them, and made law accordingly, uh, we'd be a lot better off. We'd have a lot less mischief in uh, places like Jefferson City or Lansing, Michigan, or Washington, D.C., and we'd be freer and more prosperous as a result. And even though these principles are uh, simple yet profound, uh, it really is important for us to step back from time to time from the busy work of dealing with uh, policy issues and look at the bigger picture, and that's what these principles are all about. Sometimes we are misled into thinking that policy is simply too complicated for principles, but I don't believe that's the case. Uh, we should not be like that character in uh, that Groucho Marx played in one of his movies where he said, those are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, sh we should have principles and we should stick to them. The first principle of sound public policy is free people are not equal and equal people are not free. Free people are not equal and equal people are not free. Now, what do I mean by that? I have to tell you that uh, it's the, the kind of equality that I'm referring to is not equality before the law, a very important political principle and pillar of Western civilization, something that I think all of us would readily agree with, even though we'd recognize we sometimes fall short of it. What I'm talking about more narrowly is economic equality in material wealth and income. When people are free, they're not going to be equal economically. And you hear lamentations about that all the time from people who decry the gap between the rich and the poor, 
and who want to use government to try to uh, level people. But I'm saying that if people are free, they're going to generate differences in incomes and differences in material wealth. And as long as those differences are reflections of their personal traits and abilities and ambitions, <coughs> then that's great news, not something to lament. In fact, uh, we could spend all day just talking about the reasons which explain why people are different and why those differences account for differences in income. I'll just give you three quick ones. One is talent. We're different in terms of the talents that we have. And some people uh, don't discover what their highest talent is, maybe until late in life. Best example I can think of that is from my home state of Michigan. Uh, you've all eaten products made by the Kellogg Company, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know much about the origin of that company, but there were two brothers, Will and John Harvey Kellogg, in Ballow Creek, Michigan, way back in the uh, latter part of the 19th century. And as the neighbors looked upon that family, they all thought, John Harvey is going places because he's smart, but Will Kellogg probably isn't going to amount to much because he's slow and doesn't seem to be too ambitious and probably destined to be his older brother's understudy. Uh, for the rest of his life. And he failed at an early age, W.K. did, Will, at uh, a number of ventures. He tried being a broom salesman door to door for a time, but he didn't have the personality to uh, push brooms. Uh, people would answer the door and he would say, uh, you don't happen to want to buy a broom, do you? <laughs> and uh, he, so that didn't last very long. And he ended up working for John Harvey at uh, his older brother's famous sanitarium in Battle Creek. And John Harvey was a believer in all sorts of uh, health fads and, and uh, gimmicks, and some were, had merit, some I think probably did not. But nonetheless, he was world famous. And in all the years that Will worked for his older brother, he never made more than $25 a week. And one of his uh, assignments was to prepare the breakfast food for the patients at the hospital every morning according to a formula that his older brother had put together. And that involved mixing up this uh, stuff that was kind of like a moist gruel. And then the night before, he would uh, cover it. And he went in early the next morning and uncovered it, rolled it out with a rolling pin and cut it into squares and served it in bowls. One night, he forgot to cover it. And the next morning, he went in, roll, ran the rolling pin over it, and it all flaked up. It was dried. And uh, he didn't know what to do at that point. That was all they had. So he served it in bowls as dried flakes. And the patients loved it. And uh, Will went to his older brother after a couple of days of this and said, this is the way the patients want the breakfast cereal. They don't want uh, the, the stuff we've been serving. And this is so popular, he said, I think we ought to go in business and sell this to other people outside the hospital. And his older brother dismissed it and said, that's crass commercialism. I'll never permit that. And Will kept pressing him for weeks and weeks and weeks never could get him to relent until finally, at the age of 46, never having made more than $25 a week, Will Kellogg ventures, ventures out on his own, test markets several different kinds of flakes and settles on corn, and starts the Kellogg company making corn flakes. And uh, it's a success, a modest one at first, and people told him, if you really want to take this national and make a lot of money, you need to break into the New York City market. And so Will, had to come up with some kind of a gimmick to get this stuff to sell in New York City. And so he dreams up this legendary marketing campaign around the slogan, Wednesday is Wink Day in New York. That was the official slogan. He went to grocers in uh, uh, New York City and he said, here are the rules, post them in the window. If a housewife comes into your store on a Wednesday and winks at you, she gets a free box of Kellogg Corn Flakes. And he had detailed rules about how to handle them if they come in on a Tuesday and start winking at you. <laughs> and keep in mind, this is, uh, this is risque for, this, these are Victorian times. This is 1905 America. Well, it was such a hit that in no time at all, he was sending train loads of Kellogg's cornflakes to New York City, went on from there to conquer the breakfast habits of America and much of the world. And within 20 years from the day he left his uh, brother's employment, Will Kellogg, became one of America's 20 wealthiest citizens. Now there's an example of a guy who had some talent that not even he perhaps realized that he had until late in life. Talent is one of the reasons that uh, our incomes will differ in a free and open society. Another reason 
is industry or industriousness. The fact is some people work harder and longer and better than others. And the third reason is our savings. If somehow the president tonight could equalize all of our material incomes and all of our material wealth, I would argue that for this third reason alone, in no time at all, we'd be unequal again because some of us would save it and some of us would spend it. So it's illusory to think that government should set itself up to try to equalize people economically. Why should unequal people be equal economically? And so uh, free people are simply not equal, and we should rejoice in the fact that some people take their God-given talents to great lengths and great extents, and the result is great service on behalf of all of us. But it's the second half of this first principle that I think is uh, even more powerfully inst instructive. Equal people are not free. Show me a place on the planet where people are equal economically, where they all earn the same or possess the same materially, and I would say you have found a very unfree place. Think of it, how could you ever create such a place? If it was your assignment to create a, an equal society, equal in income, could you do it just by giving speeches? Could you just get up and implore people, please don't earn more than the next guy. Please be happy with what you have. Uh, if, if you have anything more than anyone else has, give it away. Could you do that uh, materially? Could you tell people, please don't invent new things that might cause you to uh, see a nice rise in your income because then you'd be unequal? Of course not. The only way that you could ever achieve, even if it was desirable and economically equal society is to put a gun at everybody's head. You'd have to tell people, don't excel, don't be different, don't be better, don't be there first, don't invent something that will vault your firm ahead of the others, and we'd all suffer as a result. And within our lifetimes, we have seen societies that have tried that. The most extreme is uh, Cambodia. In the late 1970s, when the Khmer Rouge communists were in power, they had this radical egalitarian concept that everyone should be equal, except, of course, those in charge. They're special. They're different. They have to live well. But everybody else was to be equal economically, and you were to have nothing unless the government knew of it, sanctioned it, and probably gave it to you. Well, do you know what the end result of that was? After about three and a half years of Khmer Rouge rule, nearly two million people perished out of a population of just eight million people all because of this radical egalitarian notion of wanting to make people equal economically. The fact is, free people are not equal and equal people are not free. That suggests to us that policies of government, of any government, that are intended to forcefully equalize people, to overcome the differences that, that are manifested in our talents and in our industriousness and in our savings and other factors, are destined to failure and probably can only be implemented at the point of a gun. It's far better, far more productive to focus on removing whatever <laughs> barriers there, there may be that keep people behind and then let them take their talents to the highest uh, level they possibly can. Far more fruitful and productive uh, than to uh, try to level people and make them equal. Now, uh, if you're wondering, is he going to spend as much time on the other six as he did on the first one? <laughs> No, I, I spend more time on that one by design, and I'll go through the others a little more quickly. But <laughs> The second principle is uh, what's yours you tend to take care of. What belongs to everybody or nobody tends to fall into disrepair. What's yours you tend to take care of. What belongs to everybody or nobody tends to fall into disrepair. This principle uh, really it just cries out on behalf of the institution of private property. If you want to take uh, the wealth of any society and trash it utterly and very quickly, well, then just take what belongs to those who created it and give it to those to whom, uh, uh, who did not create it. Uh, just ignore the principle of private property, make everything common, and you'll find that all of a sudden, few people have any incentive in creating more, but everybody has incentive to simply use and abuse what there is. This explains much of the uh, collapse of the Soviet empire in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union in Russia itself, where the state said, we're going to own it all, we'll be in charge of it, we'll operate it on behalf of the people, and uh, therefore everybody will be sort of like a part owner, 
But in the end, uh, it was a prescription for economic and ecological disaster. Resources aren't cared for unless somebody can say, that's mine. It's just the way we are. It's just the way we are. Now, when we started the Mackinac Center 18 years ago on a shoestring, uh, our, for our first few years, we had a very tiny staff. And, uh, but we had events from time to time where we needed to get a picture and put it in a newsletter. But we didn't have a budget that even allowed for a good camera. But I had one that I had taken all over the world with me. So I brought it in, and I said, this will be the people's camera. Uh, Any time a Mackinac Center person is out and about uh, and needs a, to get a picture of an event, uh, you can check out the people's camera here. And let me tell you, I, had that, I used that camera for 10 years and took good care of it. Nothing ever went wrong with it until it became the people's camera. And within six months, the thing was busted and gone for good. And yet this was a staff of people who believe in private property, but it just isn't the same if it's not yours. You just don't tend to it as if it, uh, as if it were yours. Um, a third principle, uh, this goes back to a great economist named Henry Hazlitt, and he put it well when he said, sound policy consists of looking at the long run and all people, not just the short run and a few. Sound policy consists of looking at all people in the long run, not just the short run and a handful of people. So much mischief that happens in our legislatures and in Washington is in direct violation of this principle. Uh, put through by people who think, well, this will help this group without looking at what the effects might be on everyone else, or this will take care of the problem for the moment instead of taking care of it for the long run. And sometimes you can, quote, fix something for the moment, but the way you fix it actually creates an even bigger problem down the line. And you're simply not being thorough in your thinking if all you do is look at the effects of a proposal or an act or a policy on a handful of people or for the, uh, in the here and now. You have to look at both and then make a much better or informed judgment. John Maynard Keynes was a, a famous economist of the last century with whom I wouldn't have much uh, agreement. He was uh, an architect of much of our post-war inflation, growth of government, deficit spending. Somebody once asked him, Mr. Keynes, if we follow your advice and government gets bigger, spends more, runs the printing press, runs deficits, won't that mean the dollar will go down in value and maybe become worthless someday? And his famous reply was, in the long run, we're all dead anyway. <laughs> which was his way of saying, hey, if it helps us, makes us feel good for now, why not? If somebody down the line in the 1990s or beyond, they get the bill, or if they have problems, well, we'll be gone. Let them worry about it. It was Henry Hazlitt who told us that today is the tomorrow that yesterday's bad policymakers told us that we could safely ignore. And what does it say about our generation if we look so callously upon our offspring future generations and hand them problems simply because we wanted to live it up for the moment and let them worry about the consequences. Uh, again, so much mischief would be avoided if we simply were thorough in our thinking. Every time I turn the TV on at night, practically, I find in the news something that makes me think of this, uh, of this uh, fallacy, this mistaken thinking. Um, nonetheless, let me move on to principle number four. If you encourage something, you get more of it. If you discourage something, you get less of it. I am sure that one of the reasons Rex would like to see the income tax in Missouri done away with is that he understands this principle very well. That the more you tax or penalize or withdraw the rewards for a certain activity, the less of that activity you're going to get. If you want to have less work and thrift and investment, those kinds of things, less risk taking, will tax those things. Tax them until the uh, expected rewards are, are exceeded by the risks and the costs. Uh, this really tells us that people are creatures of incentive. We really are. People, human beings, are creatures of incentive and disincentive. It, they, they radically affect our behavior. And policymakers often forget this. They often act as though simply raising a tax will have no other effect than to give government more money as if we're all sheep to be sheared and we'll just willingly line up and pay as much as ever. But people often find ways to get around, especially the most onerous impositions. 
I remember the uh, 1990 tax increase. Do you recall that? This was the one after uh, George Bush, Bush the first had uh, campaigned on no new taxes, but midway in his term, um, he caved in to the Congress, and there was a tax hike signed. And in that bill, among other things, were higher taxes on uh, boats, jewelry, and aircraft. And uh, you might wonder, well, why did they raise taxes on those things? Well, I think it was in violation of at least one of the other principles I've already talked about. There was a bit of envy there, the thought that, well, who buys those things? Rich people. Rich people buy boats, aircraft, and jewelry. They've got it, so let's go get it. Let's raise taxes. Well, economists at the Joint Economic Committee sometime later looked at the impact of those higher taxes. And they discovered that uh, the end result was much different from what the planners thought it would be. They were expecting $31 million in new tax revenue in the first year of these higher levies. What actually came in was only $16 million. And then they also found, when they looked at this, that if you factor out the unemployment effects in those industries alone of those higher taxes, the unemployment that resulted because people bought less jewelry, boats, and aircraft, and then you look at how much that unemployment cost the government in unemployment outlays, that was $24 million. Only in Washington can you aim for 31, get 16, spend 24 to get it, and think you've done a public service. <laughs> But that's what happened with those 1990 tax hikes. And yet uh, uh, there are still plenty of folks in Washington who, who think that uh, just raising taxes will have no other effect other than to raise the government more money. Uh, a fifth principle, nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. Uh, uh, Milton Friedman is known for popularizing this idea. And he has gone further and said there really are only four ways uh, to spend money. Uh, think of it, only four ways to spend money, as Friedman put it. He says, one, you can spend your money on yourself. Now, the connection between the earner and the spender and the recipient of the benefits of the spending is pretty tight. It's all the same person, right? You spend your money on yourself. You'll make mistakes, but by and large, that's a pretty efficient way of spending money. Each of the other three ways departs a bit from that, and then you can see how the spending becomes a bit more inefficient. The second way is you spend your own money on someone else. You buy them a gift. <coughs> this is why bridal registries, I think, began, because too many uh, young couples were getting 20 toasters uh, for their wedding. You may have the best of intentions, and you may buy what you think they really need, but it may not be what they need or what they really want. So you have a little less efficiency when you're spending your money, but it's not for you. It's for someone else. A third way is uh, you spend somebody else's money on yourself. You go to lunch on an expense account. Okay, now you uh, certainly have an incentive not to order more than you can eat, but you have an incentive to order lobster instead of a cheeseburger, right? Because if it's an expense account, somebody else is paying it. You're spending somebody else's money on yourself. And the only other way to spend money is when you have somebody spending somebody, el somebody else's money on yet someone else. All right, no connection between the earner, spender, and the recipient of the benefits. One person spending somebody else's money on yet someone else. Great potential for mischief and waste. Which of the four kinds of spending describes what by its very nature government does every day of the week? That's what it is, right? It's not an anti-government statement, it's just an objective fact. It's somebody spending other people's <laughs> money on yet other people. And so uh, it's one of the reasons Ben Franklin said we have to be vigilant. Um, so nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. The next principle is, uh, actually I've rolled two, I used to have as six and seven into one, and then added a seventh. Both of these have something to say about government. I've combined them into one, and they read as follows. Government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. And a government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you've got. Think about that. Government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. It doesn't get it from Christmas trees. doesn't sell cookies like the Girl Scouts do. do has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody, and a government that's big enough to give you everything you want 
is big enough to take away everything you've got. There's a trade-off. There's a little story from uh, a man named Tom Anderson from Tennessee that I think really illustrates this well. It goes back uh, some years, and as he told it, there was a band of wild hogs along a bend of a river in Georgia somewhere, and this band of wild hogs was a stubborn, ornery, independent, self-reliant bunch. They had survived floods and freezes and fires and droughts and hunters and dogs and you name it. Nobody thought that these wild hogs could ever be captured. And one day a stranger came into town not far from where the hogs were. He went into the general store and he said, tell me where I could find the hogs. I have a plan to pen them up. And the storekeeper laughed at him and um, he uh, nonetheless said, well, uh, they're in this direction and off the stranger then went with nothing but a few sacks of corn, an ax, and a one-horse wagon. And he came back into town a few months later, went into the store, and he said to the storekeeper, well, I've got them all penned up, up in the swamp. I need some help to bring the hogs out. And the storekeeper couldn't believe it. And others came from miles around to hear the story of how this man had penned the hogs that everybody assumed could never be captured. The stranger said, well, it was really rather simple. At first, I made a clearing at the center of the forest with my ax. And then I put some of the corn at the center of the clearing. And for the first few days, uh, none of the hogs would come out and take any of it. But after a while, some of the younger ones came, grabbed some of the corn, and scampered back into the underbrush. And before long, the older ones were coming and taking the corn too, each of them figuring that if they didn't get their share, another one would get it in his place. And before, lo before long, he said they were all taking the corn regularly as I put it in the clearing. And he said it was about that time that I began to build a fence around the clearing, a little higher each day. And at the right place, he said, I built a trap door, and at the right moment, I sprung it. And his last line was, naturally, they squealed and hollered when they knew I had them, but I can pen any animal on the face of this earth if I can first get him to depend on me for a free handout. When I first heard that story, Mr. Anderson paused at that point, and then he said, Fellow hogs, we've been fenced. <laughs> well, some people, I've had audiences where they think, oh, he's being rabidly anti-government. And I'm saying, wait a minute, this is, this is no more radical than the views of America's founders. It was George Washington who said, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. And like fire, he said, it can be either a dangerous servant or a fearful master. This is George Washington, father of our country. Government is not reason, it's not eloquence, it's force. And like fire, it can be either a dangerous servant or a fearful master. What he's saying there is even if government is no bigger than he wanted it to be, and even if it did those things in the most efficient manner possible, even if it was the servant of the people it's intended to be, it's still what? Dangerous. You have to keep your eye on it. You can't just wind it up and walk away and expect somebody else to take care of it for you. As Franklin said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, not momentary glances in Washington's direction or wherever. You have to keep an eye on it. You have to fulfill the duties of a responsible citizen if you expect your liberties to be secure. You can't be lining up at the trough and expect your liberties to be secure. Well, the, the final principle is uh, Oh, I should point out too, by the way, uh, if you are, uh, ever want to know more about an American president who really stood steadfast for these virtues, I mean, certainly in our lifetime, Ronald Reagan is a great example. One of my favorites is Grover Cleveland. And uh, I always want to put a word in for poor Grover because he's long been forgotten, but um, he vetoed more bills than all the previous 21 presidents combined. And in one of his vetoes, which was of a uh, Texas seed bill, that would have given drought-stricken farmers in Texas 10,000 federal dollars. He vetoed it and he said, though the people may support the government, it is not the duty of the government to support the people. And we have to rely upon the charity of our fellow countrymen in times of distress, lest we travel the path of bankruptcy and dictatorship. Prophetic, and he was a Democrat barely 100 years ago. Final principle is uh, liberty makes all the difference in the world. Liberty makes all the difference in the world. Liberty was 
not too long ago in American life. It was that principle that when it was invoked on the floor of the Congress, it was powerful enough to defeat many a measure. Merely standing up and saying, this proposal is a bad one because it would do violence to the people's liberties carried a great deal of weight. Today, unfortunately, that isn't the case. Too often, all you have to argue is, well, this will help this group, and it's enough to get everybody's vote. And liberty is rarely invoked. But liberty makes all the difference in the world. In fact, think about it. How worthwhile would life be without it? It makes life worth living. Without it, few things are possible. That's how important it is. And it doesn't just happen. It isn't automatic. It isn't guaranteed. Liberty isn't something that we must assume we'll always have just because we've had it before. In fact, the numbers of people who have walked this earth who have enjoyed liberty is a tiny fraction of all the people who've ever lived. Freedom is the peculiar institution in the history of humanity. Slavery, in one form or another, is far more common. Liberty requires diligence, dedication, it requires education, it requires sacrifice, it requires passing on its virtues from one generation to another. It means being an adult steward of our liberties by sharing these values with our children. Liberty requires a lot of effort, a lot of thought, a lot of sacrifice and support. That's why I'm so excited about the growth of free market think tanks like Show Me, uh, who will be educating people in your state and beyond on some of these important principles. But sometimes, uh, I'm reminded of the importance of liberty when I learn of someone from another country where they haven't had it and who, se <coughs> excuse me, who seems to appreciate it so much more deeply than most Americans. So I'll close with a story that a few people heard last night if you were at uh, uh, the discussion club. Hope you don't mind hearing it a second time. I think of it uh, anytime I'm ever tempted to be down or discouraged. It's a great message of optimism. It reminds me of how important liberty is. This goes back to 1986 uh, when I made a uh, visit to Poland, still governed by the communist regime at that point. This is three years before the big changes uh, that ended the evil empire. And I spent two weeks with people who were active in the anti-communist pro-liberty underground within Poland. And it was a fascinating experience, meeting with underground printers who were illegally printing great works of literature and distributing it throughout Poland. Um, and at one point I asked one of the printers, where do you get the paper for all this stuff? And he said, we get it from two places. We smuggle it in from the West and we steal it from communists. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, the communist government has its factories where they make their newspapers and books and what have you, but the workers think like we do there. They're getting the government's paper out and into our hands. And sometimes when the coast is really clear, they print our stuff on the government's printing presses. <laughs> But one evening, my escort said, we want you to meet this very special couple, Zbigniew and Sofia Romashevsky. And I had never heard of them before, uh, but I was really in for a treat. They ran underground radio for solidarity during the first six months of martial law, back December of 81 to mid-82. You recall those days? There were rumors before martial law, before the crackdown, that uh, there would be a Warsaw Pact invasion of Poland. We now know that John Paul II sent word that if the Soviets invaded, he would be in Poland leading the cause against them. Um, it was, um, it was a, a rather frightening time with all the rumors swirling of an impending Soviet invasion. That didn't happen, but the communist government, at the behest of their Soviet uh, overlords, did declare martial law, and they jailed thousands of people, and uh, brought out the water cannons to break up the protests, and Poland descended into several years of darkness. And I was there in the midst of that in 86, trying to find out, well, what are people thinking? Are they taking this lying down, or are they doing something to try to free their country? And they were incredibly active on behalf of liberating their country, and they would see the fruits of that just three years later. But one night, my escort said, we want you to meet Zbigniew and uh, Sofia Romashevsky, and uh, so while I was there, I asked them many questions about underground radio. What was it like to broadcast before you were uh, found and uh, arrested? He was given, by the way, four years in jail. She was given three. They were kept in solitary confinement apart from each other for much of that time. They weren't out of prison all that long when I was there in their apartment in November of 86. 
they were eager to impress upon me how they were active again, liberty meant everything to them, and they didn't care that the police could beat down their door at three in the morning and haul them off to jail again because liberty was that important to them. I could have said, and I think I did in some fashion, that you're up against the Army, Navy, and Air Force of the Soviet Empire. How can you hope to prevail? That didn't make any difference to them. They knew they were on the right side, and they were working for the right. And uh, at one point I asked, how did you know if people were listening when you were broadcasting? How did you know if they were listening? And Sophia answered and said, uh, well, we wondered that ourselves. We could only broadcast eight or ten minutes at a time. To, then we had to go off the air to avoid being traced and detected. But one evening we said to people on the air, if you believe in liberty for Poland and in the message of this radio, please blink your lights and call your friends who you believe to think the same way and ask them to do the same. And she said, we then went to the window and for hours all of Warsaw was blinking. In the spring of 89, when General Jaruzelski had his electrifying news conference and told the world that Poland was going to have its first free elections since Soviet domination. You recall that? First big crack in the Eastern European Empire of the Soviet Union. Um, he said the reason Poland had to do that was that it had become ungovernable. And I knew exactly what he meant because I was thinking of people like the Romashevskys who didn't just sit back and figure that uh, the lack of freedom was their destiny. They believed in it strongly enough. They persevered, they fought hard, and they prevailed. And a continent today is free because of the efforts of people like them and those in the West like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and John Paul II who supported them. Liberty makes all the difference in the world. And let it never be forgotten as we shape public policy, whatever the issue, wherever the state capital, and in Washington as well. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being so uh, attentive. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. <laughs> I know I've gone a little long, so I'll try to make my answers brief. But if there are any, uh, I'd be happy to take a few questions. If you have to leave, I understand we are pushing the, uh, the time limit, so I will not be offended. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a state representative uh, in Jersey City, and I've been watching uh, the economic development try to help. And I've been watching Ireland. Yes. Their tax policy and intellectual property, and the fact that our Fortune 100, 500 companies are taking overseas. What is it that Missouri can do, and the states can do, to protect intellectual property and follow their model on tax policy from a country that was going hungry with potato famine, now they're probably the, one of the dominant uh, political forces in the world. Yeah, great question. Uh, it concerns Ireland, which at the moment has twice the growth rate of the rest of Europe. And it's directly traceable to a policy of uh, dramatic tax reductions, reductions in government spending, and making their entrepreneurial climate more friendly, their business climate more friendly to entrepreneurship and new businesses. Uh, it is the booming spot in, our, in uh, Europe, the only one that's really booming. Um, well, let me just say, in tax policy at least, I think they're leading the way. And what, what, what their policy is telling us is that people are creatures of incentive. And you reduce the burdens on enterprise, you get more enterprise. So I would say as a state legislator, it would be uh, paramount in your duties to find ways to reduce the size and spending and intrusiveness of state government and pass those savings on to people. Don't look for new programs to squander the savings on. Uh, but look, and unfortunately, in my state of Michigan, we've done some of that. Um, uh, make state government lean, mean, efficient, focused on the core fundamentals. The best economic development po policy is basically get out of the way. Well, I know we've gone late. Let me again thank you for being uh, so, such a great audience. And I want to thank Ethel May, too, because she has really worked me good in the last couple of days. <laughs> and I've had some great audiences. Thank you.